where we left off last week, we were talking about movies, um, building our faith, and then that helping with our evangelism. And I thought, okay, maybe that would be confusing because maybe you think that I want you to actually use movies for evangelism, which isn't what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the movies helping you feel something that you wouldn't otherwise feel, and that helping you in normal evangelism. Does that make sense? Um, so I think that as Christians, um, we can forget a little bit what it's like not to believe. Um, and, and we're going to go over that a little bit today. So I want to add one thing to this thing that we said last week, and that's that a good story also helps us with our faith. So listen to this. This is the quote I didn't use last week from C.S. Lewis. It's actually not, C.S. Lewis didn't say this. It was said about him. Um, it's from a book called The Spiritual Legacy of C.S. Lewis. One of the great joys of Narnia is that it is never heavy-handed. We don't get bogged down while Lewis tries to teach us something. He lets the innate power of the story operate in our hearts to make the messages real. Well, real, real is a funny word, isn't it? Because it's a story. Um, although all the key elements of Christian theology are here, here in Narnia, creation, temptation, the fall, death, judgment, redemption, heaven, he did not want to make his readers feel they were reading a work of failed theology. Instead, he saw the goal of the Narnian tales as that of preparing his reader for the gospel. Okay, so think about that in terms of story, preparing the reader for the gospel. As biography and longtime friend George Sayer has written, his idea, as he once explained it to me, was to make it easier for children to accept Christianity when they met it later in life. He hoped that um, he hoped it would be vaguely um, he hoped they would be vaguely reminded of the somewhat similar stories that they had read and enjoyed years before. So his goal was to make it easier to accept Christianity when they met it later in life. And the guy said because they would be vaguely reminded. But I think we can actually say a little bit more than just vaguely reminded. Um, instead, think about these stories. Building within your heart and mind stock responses. Okay? to various ideas. So by responses, I mean reactions. So an idea comes, and, and you kind of learn this reaction. This idea comes up, and you say, I don't like it. And this idea comes up, and you say, I like that idea. Okay, Those are kind of stock responses. Um, then, when the same ideas end up being building blocks in the case for Christianity, you, you already know and love those building blocks, and so <coughs> accepting Christianity is easier. Does that make sense? I think that's a little bit more than just vaguely familiar. And, and I think of that as gospel echoes. So we'll talk about gospel echoes or gospel parallels. Uh, which brings us to goal number two. Which, we, which came up last week, but we didn't talk about it at all. Which is, learn to watch critically. So I said last week that we long, we all long, for heaven, God, uh, and then gospel, which is a way to get to heaven and God. Um... This makes us a little bit vulnerable because if we're shown a believable heaven and God, then the writer can also slip in uh, his own way to get there, which would be a false gospel that then you would kind of somewhat like, in which case you're building sort of in your heart a stock response, but it's not a good one. Does that make sense? Um, so we'll think about it in terms of false gods. Uh, this might be anything that we make an idol of. Might be uh, having a boyfriend. Might be then I guess it would be actually the boyfriend. Uh, might be sex. Might be professional success. Might be winning. Maybe it's like a sports story or something. Might be popularity. The god might even be yourself, and the idea of being just true to yourself. Um, and then you could say maybe there's an idea of a false heaven. Uh, which would be a relationship, having a relationship, <laughs> physical pleasure, money, freedom, something that the story says, this is what heaven is. Okay? Um, and then, of course, a false gospel or religion. 
which is really just a method for getting to your heaven and God. It's actually the root of religion. If you look, at, if you look at the word uh, etymologically, it is uh, re ligate. So ligate is to bind. So it's to rebind. In other words, we've been we've been cut away from something important, and we're, and whatever this religion thing is, it's going to bring us back and bind us back to God, or whatever you think of as God. That's the idea of religion. Um, but you could have a false one. So listen to Jeremiah 2, 12 and 13. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn out cisterns, or water sources, for themselves broken cistern, cisterns that cannot hold water. So the point is, God has made you thirst for Him and for heaven, with Him. Okay, And He is the source of satisfaction for that desire. But we, as humans, tend to make other sources to fill that hole in our soul. Okay, um, And God's calling that two evils. Not, not seeking him and seeking something else. Um, so the point of seeing gospel elements as stories is not just to ooh and ah and say, oh, gospel again, I guess everybody wants a gospel. That, that's what I said last week, that that's part of the point, is to be able to realize that all men are longing for the gospel. But it's not just that, right? It's also to see that these elements in a story open our hearts and we need to be careful that the writer doesn't get the chance to slip in whatever he wants. Does that make sense? Um, so what's he going to slip in? It's not just information. It's actually feelings and reactions and responses to information. And to ideas. Make sense? All right? Am I getting boring talking about this? Okay. Um, so, part of what we're going to do in this class is hopefully help you to practice thinking about whatever story you're watching or reading and how that story is guiding you to feel. Do you know what I mean by guiding you to feel? Have I, made, have I said enough to make sense of that? Okay. Because I think, this is based on all of what I've said, I think that if a movie shows something that's grossly sinful, but it guides you to hate that. Then that is better than a movie that shows some less horrible sin, but it guides you to think of it as funny or attractive uh, or fun. Does that make sense? Yep. Question. But what about not setting any sinful thing before now? Yes. So the question was, um, what about not setting any evil thing before our eyes? Um, and, and I think we have to go back, even in this, to ask, what makes a thing evil? Right? There's a lot of Old Testament that are very evil that is put right before our eyes when we read it, too. But that's, it is scripture, right? True. But it's before our eyes. Yeah, so I'm asking something. What makes, what makes it evil before your eyes? Should we answer now or should we come back? Our first response might be it's contrary to the word of God. You wouldn't be able to watch the news if that was the case. <clears throat> Sure, but we don't have a biblical mandate even to watch the news. So we could say, can't watch the news, it would be possible. I would suggest to you, and this is kind of what I've been saying, that what makes it evil is that it elicits in you an evil response. Does that make sense? Evil response or wrong response? Uh, yes. Same thing. Same thing. Um, 
So for one person, it may not be evil because they think critically about it and realize that it's, and it does not provoke an evil response. But for another person that, for lack of a better word, is duped into thinking something that's not true, uh -huh. it becomes evil for them whether they realize it or not. Yes? Yeah. The moral code that we've grown up with is different than the moral code that our children are growing up with. Based upon sure. our cultural yeah. Well, Jesus says that it is evil to look at a woman for the purpose of lust. Right? Um, which which I've, I've had a friend um, challenge me that... Um, he has felt in his own actions um, well maybe I won't tell the story I, I gotta get going um, <laughs> um, the, the point of the story is that if you look at something with the hope of a chance to lust even if that turns out to be uh, not something that you lust for, um, it's still sinful because you were still trying to make a choice to go, oh, I want to look at that. Does that make sense? No. Okay, well, that's, it made sense before I said it. Um, <laughs> let's keep going. Maybe we'll have time to get back to this. Um, <laughs> Uh, so goal number three is to correct what's false. Um, how should we feel about what's false? All right. Um, so I'm going to suggest that there should be an element of objection, obviously, to something that's false. We should object to what's false. But I think there also should be an element of understanding. Um, let me read this uh, slightly long um, passage from Tim Keller, Reason for God book. I want to make a proposal that I have seen bear much fruit in the lives of young New Yorkers. I, I recommend that each side, when he says side, he means believers and unbelievers who are discussing, look at doubt in a new way. Let's begin with believers. A faith without doubts is like a human body without antibodies in it. People who blindly go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about what they believe, uh, about why they believe as they do, will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a skeptic, of a smart skeptic especially. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if, if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts which should only be discarded after long reflection. You don't often hear Christian people recommending that you think about your doubts, right? That's a little strange. Believers should acknowledge and wrestle with doubts, not only their own, but their friends and neighbors. It's no longer sufficient to hold beliefs just because you inherited them. In other words, you shouldn't believe what you believe just because your parents did. Only if you struggle long and hard with your objections to your faith will you be able to provide grounds for your beliefs to skeptics, including your own self, that are plausible rather than ridiculous or offensive. And, just as important for our current situation, such a process will lead you, after you come to a position of strong faith, to respect and understand those who doubt. That was kind of long. But I think that we need an element of understanding of what's false. Where we, real, where we realize, um, where we kind of remember the difficulty of the path from unbelief to belief. 
Does that make sense? So we look at these, we'll look at these false teachings that are popular in our culture because they're in movies because they're popular in our culture in the writers, they like them, and people who watch them like them, right? Um, and, and seeing it in movies will cause us to kind of feel or experience the allure of anti-Christian ideas. And then we can say, yeah, uh, there but for, but for the grace of God go I. I can see that that's appealing. That's, that's something that people like to believe. And if God hadn't shown me better, I'd probably like to believe. Does that make sense? Um, so think about this um, idea, okay? Here, here's, I should have like a red hat when I say something that's not, because it can get confusing. But this is like a red hat idea. Okay? God would want us to be true to our own selves and follow our own heart. Right? Surely he's more interested in our happiness than rules about what he wants. That's a very faith-challenging idea, but it's very common. Right? And, and it ends up in real life where people say, should I stay in this unhappy marriage when my wife obviously doesn't like, love me and my coworker obviously does? Um, after all, God wants me to be happy, right? I mean, people who have a vague idea of God will say things like that. Um, and, and the biblical argument against that is that our heart is deceitfully wicked above, among all things. And yep. Will, will pull us away in, 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 a, in a sinful direction if we allow it to. Yeah. And it's pulling our friends. Right? Um, so it helps you be sympathetic with your friends at school, with your coworkers. Um, they're struggling about their conscience and about some path of right that they're trying to think up. Um, and we want to think about how we can help them on the path from unbelief to belief. And if you've never thought about that path for them and, and what where they are in their thinking, then it's going to be really hard to help them on that path. Does that make sense? Um, all right, we'll keep going. So then we also have to ask, what if it's our wrong feelings? So again, an asterisk by feelings. This, is, this really ought to be something more like reactions, passions, uh, affections, um, responses, gut reactions, things like that. Uh, last week we talked a lot about feelings, and then Mitch, Mitch Bernstrom um, came up afterwards and gave me an 11-page paper on the relationship between thinking and feeling. And it, it was really, it was, he pulled it out of this giant folder that he has. Of, I'm wondering what other papers he's got in there. <laughs> wow. Okay, but he ends with, he ends that paper with what I think is maybe the most significant scripture passage that quickly shows you how to think about the relationship between feelings and thinking. And that, and that is Jesus, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures, but lay up for your tre yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For, and he uses the word for, which is a logical connector, where he's saying, why should you do that? And what comes next is the answer to why. Okay, that's what the Greek word gar is for. Uh, four, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So Jesus is saying, make choices that are God-centered choices, and then as you make them, your heart will follow. Um, if your feelings are wrong, then, the fix to that involves thinking even though the problem seemed like it was wrong feelings. Does that make sense? Feelings are quick, and they're automatic responses, right? You do them without even thinking. Do you know what I mean? It feels like they happen to you. So we, think, so we say things like, he makes me so mad, right? Well, he did things and you became mad. Um, the question is then, and this is what Mitch's paper uh, revolved around partially, was the question, are you responsible for your feelings? If they happen automatically um, and like a, just a gut reaction, 
then are you responsible for them? Answers? Captive, so yeah, there's feelings follow our thoughts. Yeah, well, Mitch wrote this paper largely because people were telling him, <coughs> No, you react, feelings just happen to you, um, they just happen. You're responsible for your thoughts and your actions, but how you feel, um, that just happens to you. Um, so, I would suggest to you that you are responsible for them, not necessarily directly. Um, but think of think of how they can be trained, okay? So I'm gonna say I, an analogy that was given to me way back in high school was that feelings are kind of like the caboose on a train, and and the engine is like your will. So you may in your choices change directions, but it's gonna be a long time before the caboose changes directions. Um, and you've got to stay on that new direction for a while, and then your caboose will. Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> There, it's an analogy, and there's hardly any reason just in the analogy to believe it, but um, I, I think it's true. But I think of it more in terms of training, right? And the point is that you and other people alongside of you can critique your emotional responses and help you change them over time if you let them, okay? So we're going to do more on this later because we're going to do the intro to Pride and Prejudice, so we'll come back to this. Um, okay, so the next thing on this one is that doctrine comes alive um, and becomes interesting when we see it in contrast to error. Um, Mike and I are trying to think of uh, a way to do a theology class, so we're working on that. Uh, we really want to teach theology, but I think that looking at error is actually a nice way to start. Why is that? Because theology can be kind of boring, right? Um, Okay, so here's a story. I told Lucas I was going to use the story. He said, okay. So one night at youth group, Lucas comes up to me and says, a friend at school believes in speaking in tongues. I've been trying to discuss it with him. And what should I say? Do you remember the conversation? Vaguely. Okay. And, and, I, and we had just finished. Okay, we, so this may be embarrassing for Lucas. Tell, tell me um, we had just finished like five weeks before talking for about a month about miraculous gifts and are they for today and all this and um, and so I said to Lucas well that's great because we just finished talking about this and Lucas said I know I wish I could remember what we said <laughs> so sorry if that's we've uh, all been there yeah. and, but that conversation I mean I, I that blew me away honestly that conversation because it made me feel like um, what teaching that I'm doing is actually um, going to last longer than a week or a month. Do you know what I mean? Um, no, Lucas, you didn't break my heart. Okay. Don't worry. Um, it made me say, okay, there's got to be a way to have a better impact, right? Where, it la where five weeks later you can go, I remember a few things. I can answer this, right? And I, and I don't know, maybe... Um, maybe feeling it in a story, and then, okay, so if I sat down with Lucas that day and did the same things we had done five weeks before, I think he would have maybe retained it better because he's thinking in his mind, I need this now. Uh, just a theory. Um, <clears throat> okay, goal number four, to help our apologetics. Uh, what is apologetics? Defense. Defense of the gospel, yes. So apologetics, Christian apologetics, is the practice of presenting a rational basis for your belief, for your faith. Uh, there's a couple branches of apologetics. Did you know that? I'm going to give two, which are evidentialism and presuppositionalism. So raise your hand if you could think you could define either of these. Jen can. Lucas can. Um, somebody taught Lucas better than I did. <laughs> um, all right, so define evidentialism. Evidentialism, evidential apologetics, is a defense of the gospel based upon the evidence that is presented in the physical world. Yeah, you can find evidence anywhere, right? I mean, you could say, look at Scripture. This was written over thousands of years, and look how consistent it is. That's really weird. That's evidence that it's 
got one divine author, okay? Um, you can say, look at the historical record with regard to Jesus and the birth of the church, right? Uh, name another church that has a risen leader. Nobody else tried that in religion. Uh, and yet, when Christianity tried it, it took off like wildfire. Like wildfire. Thousands of Jews who didn't think anybody could raise from the dead, all of a sudden believe it. So you've got to explain that. That's weird. Um, that's evidentialism. Uh, presuppositionalism. Jen, you want to try presuppositionalism? Well, I think that you accept certain things as fact and base your beliefs on that. Right, but it but presuppositionalism then explores the move from there, and how well does that go? Does that make sense? So it starts from a hypothesis or a hypothetical. Yep. And you a see presupposition. You take the roof off the house. You see what happens when you build build these walls, and then this can't stay. Right. So pre so pre have we got that right? Presuppositionalism <laughs> says says to another person of another faith, what do you believe? What are your what are your beliefs? And then, and then, and then, can we explore those? Because how do you how do you connect this belief you have with this one? It doesn't seem <coughs> consistent. And the point is that other religions, when you examine them in their own uh, principles, they don't make sense. That's presuppositionalism, and Christianity does. So, as an example, let's look at the blind man and the elephant. Um, has everyone heard of the blind man and the elephant? I think this is too big of an image because it's uh, it's really slow for that one to come up. Um, okay, so this is the blind man and the elephant. So the story of the blind man and the elephant is that a king asks several blind men to feel an elephant, okay, and then later he's going to ask them, "What was that thing?" Okay, and just for fun. I put in lots of pictures. So <laughs> this is really an um, important... Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a little ivory carving. Um, um, and then, okay, so the point of the story, right, is that um, later they come back and, they, and they're supposed to explain to the king what the elephant was like and what do they say? This guy says, it was like a tail, it was like a snake, this elephant. The elephant is very much like a snake. This guy says, no, he's like a wall, no, he's like a tree trunk, no, he's like a spear, because he's the tusk. Yeah. Okay, um, so you get the idea. And then Buddha ends this parable, this is a, um, Buddha ends it like this. Oh, how they cling and wrangle or fight. Some who claim for preacher and monk the honored name, for quarreling, each to his view they cling. Such folk only see one side of a thing. So what's the moral of the parable of the blind man and the elephant? The moral is the there is one All the religions are pointing to the same thing, they're just seeing the Right. And so what does that tell you that you should change about yourself? And if this is true, you know, the person who reads this parable to you, um, what is he trying to tell you to do or not do as a Christian believer? Because you're a universalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. basically, all religions are true, and then you just kind of ignore whether they're true or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good enough. To accept that maybe you don't, you don't have the whole story and you shouldn't make a claim that you have the whole story. That's. Um, and the whole story can't be known. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we wouldn't claim to know the whole story. Okay. Uh, all right. So answer this parable. Give a apologetic regarding this parable. How would you respond? To it. Your friend has just told you this, and you want to say, uh, you shouldn't think that way. Here's why. Two things that are opposed to each other but are claiming to both be true can't both possibly be true. 
in the same universe. Well, but they're arguing that um, <coughs> that this is true. The, this is a wall, and and this is true because this is like a snake. So they're saying, no, 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 it's, they both can be true. That's the point. I'm going to be I'm gonna be obnoxious here. I so know. Yeah, I'm, trying, I'm, not, yep. form, I'm not formulating it well, but yep. 2 plus 2 is always 4. You can't say it's 5 or 16 million or something. Right, but their response is, yes, 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 2 plus 2 is 4, but you only know 2. This guy knows the other 2, and that's 4, but you don't know that other 2. <laughs> All right, so an, an entertaining response that I've heard to this is, what if the elephant talks and says, uh, I'm an elephant? <laughs> right. Okay, so what? let's categorize that response. Presuppositionalist or evidentialist? Presuppositionalist. <laughs> evidentialist, presuppositionalist. Which one is it? <laughs> Depends on if you have your blindfold on or not. I think it's evidentialist. Because what it's saying is, um, okay, so the speech that you're talking about is scripture. So if you're going to make the claim that the elephant is speaking and telling you, I'm an elephant and here's what I'm like, here's what I want you to know about what I'm like, then the way he speaks, we say, is scripture. So, so in order to... Um, substantiate that claim, you're going to have to give evidence that Scripture is reliable. Okay, right? the Christian's response is, That's the Christian is evidential. I was saying, I thought that the, the atheist or the, the, the non-Christians, the start of the story, isn't that presupposition? They're presupposing oh. that re religion uh -huh. can, can't be seen completely and fully understood by one person or one side of the world. Okay, so I think you're leaning toward another Christian response. I, I'm asking the Christian response, what's the evidentialist Christian response, and what's the presupposition Christian response to this parable? So give me a, a presuppositionalist Christian response. Is that what you're raising your hand? Well, I, I hope this is one. <laughs> um, like, for this parable to work, you also have to have the character of the king who in fact observes that this is in fact the same animal. Right. You know, what if it was all just blind guys and one of them got a hold of a baboon and they'd say, why, this creature's a angry, bitey thing as opposed to... <laughs> so, here's the point. Okay, let's stick with, let's not go to the baboon. Let's stick with the... <laughs> let's stick with the king, the existence of the king in this story. Okay, because the, the moral of the story, remember, is do not make universal claims about religion. That's the moral of, of this, is that you, wall feeler, don't claim to know the whole thing about God. Okay? You just made a universal claim by saying Right. The, the teller of this story is violating his own principle. Self-contradiction. Because he's saying, we're starting with an elephant. We're starting with this whole thing. I am going to make a universal claim about God and, and what he's really like. Um, and everybody else who's listening to me is, is needs to think of themselves as blind. So, so this story violates its own tenets. Does that make sense? That's, that's a presuppositional... Uh, right? Okay. <clears throat> Did that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, Okay, so why talk about all of that? Because So we're getting back to movies and stories. Okay, So the reason to talk about that is if you're going to do presuppositional apologetics, then you've really got to interact with and examine and feel, although not the best word, the false ideas of your culture in order to see the holes in them. Does that make sense? So, does that make sense? Yeah. And, and isn't there a biblical mandate almost for that to be mindful of? I mean, taking every thought captive. Well, that means that you need to be wary. That needs to be, and there was those men that understood the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. They weren't staying isolationalists and and not engaging the culture to redeem it. They were. 
that, that's what they that, that's what they were trying to do. They were doing those things instead of instead of uh, just uh, rejecting and, and staying in a monk at a top, ivory tower. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, Jesus, Paul, they both say that we're not to be out of the world. We're just to have the world out of us, and we have to guard our hearts to get there. And Paul used well, in that great speech in Acts. 17? He, yep. talk, he brings up their own stories about their gods. Yes. To make a point to get them to understand where he was going, but when he mentions the resurrection, it falls apart because they have. So, do you know this? Do you know this story he's talking about? This is Acts 17, the Sermon on Mars Hill, and um, people who try to engage culture and talk about culture and religion like to, like to refer to Mars Hill. So, there's a couple different churches named after that place. Um, do you ever ask yourself, okay, Paul could give that sermon in the way he did and interact with those uh, pagan teachers because he had been trained and he knew their teaching, right? So is that a happy accident or is that a good thing to do? In other words, um, is it good to do that training so that you can have that sermon later? Does that make sense? Or, or is it, you shouldn't learn those things, but if you have learned them, then you can use them to interact with your culture. I think it's kind of both. Um, so I think that there's some situations where um, we're exposed to certain teachings. Um, so for instance, I, I remember when I was in high school, in a biology class in the evolution unit, and I had a ton of people at my church at the time saying, don't listen to anything they say, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong. And it's like, well, listening to it and evaluating it and finding where's, where's the problem with it, yeah. um, I think was a, a very good exercise because that's something that I'm going to deal with with um, people throughout my entire life. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, um, I, I'm not going to necessarily seek out um, certain other religions and learn everything that I can about them in the happy chance that I might you know, run across a, a Mormon or something. I might not invest all the time to investigate what their teachings are, but if I run into one, maybe I'll investigate a little bit so that I can have an intelligent discussion. Yeah, and I, and, and I think if you were going to um, another country, maybe a Muslim country, you would go, okay, I need to know a lot more about that. Sure. Yeah. Dan? I think, yep. I just think of uh, um, Proverbs comes to mind when you talk about how Proverbs forces us to look at things of the world and contrasts that with biblical wisdom. And just for example, um, before a man, uh, before his downfall, before his downfall, man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. There's a, Proverbs helps us to look at things in the world that are sinful, that are wrong. Yep. that are flawed, and view them from the godly perspective. And if you want to not fall, you have to start by saying, I'm not going to be proud. Which I think in this class um, means, um, I'm going to let other people be beside me and say, the way you're feeling about this is not right. And you should change. Um, as opposed to just saying, um, I feel what I feel. Don't tell me what to feel. Um, another one? We need to move on to Pride and Prejudice, which I think will... Pardon me if I'm going to say something that you covered since I got late, but just... Uh, uh, my dad worked in a bank most of his life, and uh, he, he told me... He, he talked about how people in banks were trained... how they were trained to deal with counterfeits. And the way they were trained to deal with it was they were trained to know the real thing as well as they could. Counterfeits can take so many different forms. If you know the real thing, you spot any counterfeit without having to know any specific one. Yep. And in a world where we all have limited resources in terms of time and energy, yep. it may be, and it's not wrong, I don't think, but it may be better to focus our energy on knowing the real thing, knowing it well. So any little thing that's subtle that comes in, we can say, that's not right. Yep. Well, that's true. So Mitch is making a, essentially a counterpoint to this whole class. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You've already said that. I'm okay with that. that Lucas might have, for, 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 
lack of a better illustration of our nature, who just may have learned the truth, the non-counterfeit better, had he been exposed to the counterfeit first. That was one of your points earlier, oh. was that yeah. you were able to explain doctrine by showing a, a counter doctrine. I think that that's true, and I would just give, uh, my, I guess my reaction to that would be that um, in life, we get shown things that are false, that are appealing to our soul. And even though they're false, they're counterfeit. Um, <coughs> kind of wish they're true. We wish, yeah, maybe we wish they're true. Um, it, it's nice to have help sometimes where someone explains, don't fall for that. That's not true for this reason. Notice this in there. You know, um, I think the blind man and the elephant, maybe that parable kind of helped. I mean, that's an appealing parable. And it, it's, um, did you pause already? Because we haven't really started Pride and Prejudice. Okay, let's pause. Let's go on to Pride and Prejudice.